Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. I am Zach, your chill companion through the world of leftist literature. And tonight I have another special guest joining me. It's going to be Dan Platt of the Three Lefts podcast. Uh, he is a political organizer. He's been involved in third party politics for quite some time. He's run for office. And uh, we are going to continue on with the Conquest of Bread, Chapter 5. We tried last week and had some technical difficulties, so we're going to do it again. We're back up on the, the saddle, and we're going to uh, do as much as we can tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to give Dan a call, and we will start. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? So you did your intro. Yep, I just did my intro, so... Uh, I do mine again. Yeah, if you'd like to give the audience your pronouns again and as much of your biography as you feel comfortable with sharing. Of course. Um, oh, I'll share. I'll share. Um, I love the share. I'm a communist. <laughs> um, so, my name is Dan Platt. I am the ho- one of the hosts of the Three Left Show, a program that I do uh, via community radio, but also podcast. I uh, basically discuss both news, but mostly also strategy for the left. So if you've already gone through 101 programs explaining general leftist theories from the past 200 years, and you've already kind of got a base of knowledge built up from activism, or maybe just watching other people do activism, then uh, The Three Lefts is the show for you. Now, I've run for office as a Green uh, mostly as an outreach campaign to talk to, you know, uh, just ca- talk to people via canvassing, base build, whatever you want to call it. I have, uh, I'm a veteran occupier, so I've trained in consensus uh, and working in uh, teams and whatnot. And all those skills that certain jobs ask for, but don't actually want. They just want people <laughs> to take orders or something of that nature. Yeah, I feel that um, for sure. So, and so currently I just do a, a smattering of community projects um, and whatever spare work I can pick up, service sector stuff. Um, I fit the mold of many type of millennial archetypes, uh, including yep. that I sort of, uh, not strongly, but identify as aromantic and, uh, and whatnot. But I'm also masculine. I, I identify as masculine, so he, he pronouns. Um and uh and other things and jewish uh so happy passover happy passover happy passover just got back from just got back from my family seder oh wonderful how did that go uh the usual i have four young nieces so it's a bit wild oh Um, yeah we made we got we got through it once again usually by skipping a a quarter of it but that's fine (laughs) Better, better than forcing ourselves to cringe through it along while the yeah. while the girls are basically not paying attention uh-huh. and all yeah. they just want to play, which is fine. They're oh, kids; yes. they should play. Uh-huh. They should play. We want them to play. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so having a discussion about the Passover story is, you know, we're not school. Yeah, yeah. As yeah, as I recall, it's it's a lot of uh, long readings and uh, stuff that uh, is not happening today on TV anywhere. So. It can be a lot well, for young years to uh, focus on, but it's a good lesson in in focusing. And uh, I'm I'm doing a seder tomorrow with friends, including my co-host, and it's definitely going to be a bit more loose, where more like discussion, telling the Passover story like drunk history, maybe. Oh, I love and, it. And you know, after we have the first glass of wine, and then we tell the Passover story, and then we have discussions about what freedom means to us, oppression. Mm. Uh, do a little Israel bashing, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, where are the new where are the pharaohs now? Oh man, um, whatever. But I found a secular Haggadah, um, oh. which is a seder, uh, you know, the script. Sure. Yes. And so it has um, it wraps in some intersectionality and is Ooh. more conversation and discussion based. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Yes. All right. Well, are you ready to uh, dive into this chapter uh, on food? Yes, now that I'm completely stuffed. <laughs> yeah, now that you have a lot of it. <laughs> I, I, I am unhungry and thus uh, unable to do revolution. <laughs> ah, that's how they get you. Or the opposite, I am able to do revolution because I'm well fed. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it can go either way, can it? Yeah, you gotta, you got to find that balance there. All right, well, let, let's uh, dive right into Chapter 5 of The Conquest of Bread. And, uh, yeah, Dan, don't, feel, don't be shy about uh, stopping me at any point. Just... Uh, 
dive in with yeah. whatever thoughts and comments you I'll have. just say, I'll just say, like, cut. Yep, go. That, that works perfectly. Let's get to it. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 5. Food. Part 1. If the coming revolution is to be a social revolution, it will be distinguished from all former uprising not only by its aim, but also by its methods. To attain a new end, new means are required. The three great popular movements which we have seen in France during the last hundred years differ from each other in many ways but they have one common feature. In each case, the people strove to overturn the old regime and spent their heart's blood for the cause. Then, after having borne the brunt of the battle, they sank again into obscurity. A government composed of men, more or less honest, was formed and undertook to organize. The Republic in 1793, Labor in 1848, and the Free Commune in 1871. Imbued with Jacobin ideas, this government occupied itself, first of all, with political questions such as the reorganization of the machinery of government, the purifying of the administration, the separation of church and state, civic liberty, and such matters. It is true the workmen's clubs kept an eye on the members of the new government and often opposed their ideas on them. But even in these clubs, whether the leaders belonged to the middle or to the working classes, it was always the middle class ideas which prevailed. They discussed various political questions at great length, but forgot to discuss the question of bread. All right, I'm gonna, I was going to pause it myself. Yeah, uh, you go ahead with your we thoughts. We could probably first. pause. We could also like do a, do a system where we pause every other paragraph. Yeah, that makes sense. Right to summarize and stuff. So, like, what he's saying here is that you know the the French Revolution and revolutions after that reform periods mm-hmm. are still kind of locked around the bourgeois because they have yeah. the means of actually forming a new government, right. the skills of statecraft. Uh, the division of labor, and thus the and the division of labor creates a hierarchy of uh, information. You know, the well informed versus the working classes that are not well informed and don't know how to, or don't have the information in front of them to the, to govern, right, uh, or to know what policies to pursue, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and can we be surprised when uh, the middle class takes over as the new rulers that they? talk mostly and act mostly on middle class uh, problems rather than what the promise of the revolution was in the first place, that being things like bread for all and, and you know, everyone's needs being met. Um, it seems like uh, it's... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, that, like, the, the last 200 years, like, since the Enlightenment, revolutions happen, middle class revolutions, right. this merchant class overcoming the power of the old military leader class Mm -hmm. Uh, because in the renaissance or you know all before that political power is held by those who hold uh well uh violence monopoly violence Mm -hmm. you know leaders of armies and kings are thus you know they're they're generals more or less Mm -hmm. and merchants overtook that and that's capital overcoming political uh, violent cap violence capital for sure so um and but they uh the middle classes can only do this with the support of lower classes yeah. revolting at the same time. Yeah, well, and also with support of the military. I mean, we, we saw two very different, uh, I guess you could, couldn't even call one of them a revolution um, on January 9th when, uh, without the backing of the military in a, in a industrialized, uh, you know, military superpower, the U.S., when a bunch of people tried to uh, even delay the, the gears of government, how swiftly that was a... Uh, met with uh, a rebuff uh, versus what happened in, in Myanmar, where they actually did have a military coup and were able to take over. So it's, it's hard to imagine these days the, the sort of revolution that Kropotkin is talking about really taking place in any place that's, that's still a world superpower, as long as it is not declined sufficiently to a point where it is weak militarily or... Yeah, I mean, even, even when you have a large group of people organized to wage civil war, mm-hmm. that's still a, you know, a, a large struggle like in Syria, where right. you'll have a ruling class that still holds the military. Mm-hmm. So, so it's usually discussed by like one of my more weird but law, he has a law degree and whatever. <laughs> but he always talked of how like if we're actually going to do any kind of revolution, we need to split the military up. Uh, like we need like a, a section of them to join the either the left or 
instead of espousing left-wing values, the populist values of anti-corruption and mm-hmm. and uh, and whatever. But the, the, then then it becomes like, well, who is the people that these veterans are, are fighting for us? Right. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For this working class. All right. Well, let's let's continue along here. Great ideas sprang up at such times. Ideas that have moved the world. Words were spoken which still stir our hearts at the interval of the century. But the people were starving in the slums. From the very commencement of the revolution, industry inevitably came to a stop. The circulation of produce was checked, and the capital concealed itself. The master, the employer, had nothing to fear at such times. He battened on his dividends, if indeed he did not speculate on the wretchedness around but the wage earner was reduced to live from hand to mouth. Want knocked at the door. Famine was abroad in the land, such famine as hardly been seen under the old regime. The Girondists are starving us, was the cry of the workmen's quarters in 1793, and thereupon the Girondists were guillotined, and full powers were given to the mountain and to the commune. The commune indeed concerned itself with the question of bread, and made heroic efforts to feed Paris. At Lyon, Fouché and Collot de Ebois established city granaries, but the sums spent on filling them were woefully insufficient. The town councils made great efforts to procure corn. The bankers who hoarded flour were hanged, and still the people lacked bread. Then they turned on the royalist conspirators and laid the blame at their door. They guillotined a dozen or fifteen a day, servants and duchesses alike, especially servants, for the duchess had gone to Koblenz. But if they had guillotined a hundred dukes and viscounts every day, it would have been equally hopeless. The one only grew. So it's pointing out that, you know, vengeance doesn't really solve much. Uh, You know, you can you can take all the revenge you want on the ruling class, you know, hang Bezos. It doesn't really (laughs) transfer the uh, the wealth he apparently holds into, you know, our pockets as a as a UBI or something. Right. For sure. Um, Now, I learned since last week that the mountain being referred to here Mm. refers to the very large. And, and actually, my local government has a similar type of um, council chambers, mm-hmm. where the uh, president of the ch- of the council or the central committee, you know, the leaders, they're up on a really high bench mm-hmm. desk, looking down on the rest of the assembly. Got it. That's called. That's referred to as the mountain. So, oh, yeah. Interesting. Interesting note there. But yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think, too, in, in this day and age when so much wealth is, is basically theoretical uh, based on things like the stock market, which, you know, in the, in the case of an actual revolution, yeah. would almost certainly tank. <laughs> you know, there goes a lot future of that. value, future value as well as the value that like the GDP and growth of it. Right. That is, say, 40 percent bullshit jobs, as David Graeber right. found out. Yeah. So it's, it's not just about redistribution and, and opening the coffers and stuff. It's about actually seizing the, the, the means of production, you know, uh, getting a hold of, of, in Amazon's case, say, their uh, fulfillment centers. And, and, the, yeah, and getting a handle, yeah, getting a handle on the economy as a whole, what the commons are, and then what are the means of distribution. For sure. All right. Of the commons, access to it. For sure. The wage earner cannot live without his wage. And the wage was not forthcoming. What difference could a thousand corpses more or less make to him? Then the people began to grow weary. So much for your vaunted revolution. You are more wretched than ever before, whispered the reactionary in the ears of the worker. And little by little, the rich took courage, emerged from their hiding places, and flaunted their luxury in the face of the starving multitude. They dressed up like scented fops and said to the workers, Come, enough of this foolery. What have you gained by rebellion? Sick at heart, his patience at an end. The revolutionary had to at least admit to himself that the cause was lost once more. He retreated into his hovel and awaited the worst. So there you have it. Yeah, you, you try and uh, focus on things that are not the revolution, um, that is getting revenge, and you, you give ammunition to the people that are still holdouts against it. You know, they, they have... I find, it, I find it interesting that similar to like maybe the Soviet Union's purges and whatnot, that mm-hmm. You're fighting a civil war, you obviously do this. You right. you kill a lot of the reactionaries, and but it never seems to be enough. You can never kill all the reactionaries, no, no, um, especially when it comes to 
you know, the whole world, you know, you have other capitalist powers that then can exert propaganda in the third world. But yes, I mean, it's not always, it's not always very effective, but it's certainly effective in their own countries. Yeah. Um, because as long as we have the new deal era, um, with the new deal programs being in effect and the welfare, welfare state, um, the cheap home ownership that was given to non-blacks, like my Jewish grandparents with the GI Bill, you know, they moved to the suburb out of the Bronx, so they weren't around doing socialist stuff anymore. Uh, and that, that yeah. kind of ran its course. Yeah, that, that really ties in concepts of uh, urban planning, and especially things like new urbanism. It's very hard to organize when people are so physically spread, even in this day and age when you have a lot of online organizing, it, it doesn't completely substitute the, the actual getting together in neat space to, uh, you know, spread ideas and, and actually form community bonds and stuff like that. So, Something I didn't say was that, um, so my background's in architecture. So right. and the cool, and the thing about new urbanism, because I've actually read the books or the magazines that mm -hmm. like, this is a movie that started in the eighties yeah. by these, you know, middle-class professionals, PMC types that knew that like, Suburbia, the 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 bad the, the negatives of suburbia, mm -hmm. but their 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 um, strategy for like reversing this was not to acknowledge the market forces that caused suburbia and why things were planned that way, which is what I researched when I was mm -hmm. in school to learn that it was very much a capitalist process of to suburbanize and to oh, yeah. move things out and apart um, right. and build a highway system. Um, but the new urbanists didn't want to reverse any of that road building and stuff. They just wanted to make these more dense yeah. suburban enclaves, which is what kind of occurs. But then you get these enclaves that are suburban enclaves that are pretty much being built in urban centers. Right. And this is being touted by similar PMC planners as like, we're making the city more walkable. Mm -hmm. Density is the answer to right. uh, high housing costs and whatever. With, and they, they, they're completely naive. Yeah, they, they tend to focus on one aspect or another and kind of miss the, the forest for the trees. Yeah, and so anyone so points out their classism or, or that this this the housing development isn't solving any real problems, they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, oh yeah, that, that tends to be a, a big facet of it too. You look at places like uh, Seaside, Florida, which was touted as one of the you know first great new yeah, urbanist projects. Right, yeah. It's... It, I'm sure it's beautiful. I haven't actually been there myself, but I've seen photos and stuff. It looks beautiful. It looks but it's like, not. It's not for anyone working, uh, earning less than forty grand. There you got it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very homo homogeneous in in terms mm -hmm. of class. So, yeah, hard to build class consciousness when you only have one uh, type of people around. So, yeah, let's continue on. Then the reaction proudly asserted itself and accomplished a bloody stroke. The revolution dead, nothing remained but to trample its corpse underfoot. The white terror began. Blood flowed like water. The guillotine was never idle. The prisons were crowded, while the pageant of rank and fashion resumed its old course, and went on as merrily as before. This picture is typical of all our revolutions. In 1848, the workers of Paris placed three months of starvation at the service of the Republic, and then, having reached the limits of their powers, they made one last desperate effort an effort which was drowned in blood. In 1871, the commune perished for lack of combatants. It had taken measures for the separation of church and state, but it neglected, alas, until too late, to take measures for providing people with bread. And so it came to pass in Paris that the elegants and fine gentlemen could spurn the Confederates and bid them to go sell their lives for a miserable pittance and leave their betters to feast at their ease in fashionable restaurants. At last, the commune saw its mistake and open communal kitchens, but it was too late. The days were already numbered, and the troops of Versailles were on to the ramparts. Bread. It is bread that the revolution needs. Cut. Let others spend their time. So I, 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 a thought occurred to me at the beginning of that paragraph mm -hmm. that, you know, when, when revolutions occur and there's violence, it's always, it's always seen as like the worst possible violence. It is murder being done to people, right? Right. But then when the established order or the, you know, reactionaries get in power mm -hmm. uh, or conservatives or what have you, and they do the same, if not more amount of violence, but they're doing it in the name of stability and mm -hmm. 
tradition and whatever that is papered over in the future mm-hmm. as being just violence, right. right? The just violence of our current system, the now people locks up, the police murders, it's all justifiable. It's not like a war crime. But if we left wingers, you know, because it's, we're not the government or I suppose, you know, if, if a working class or any other type of faction fights us over war, it's on us, right? That we are doing we're committing mass violence, but the American empire doesn't commit mass violence despite the actual measurable harm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point for sure. Mostly because like the difference is that one is disciplined while revolutionary violence is very undisciplined. It yeah. seems very random that well, there are mistakes being made, even though of course disciplined violence makes all kinds of mistakes too, but they um, don't, yeah. They're not seen as mistakes, you know, no, when, no, when it just... executes uh, an innocent person, let's say, uh-huh. that's still just, you know, the price of, of quote unquote freedom for others. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the, you know, the price of maintaining the order and maintaining the system, stuff like that. You know, any, any mistakes that made are made are, are seen as outliers or not indicative of any larger uh, systemic issue. But yeah, you're, yeah. you're right in the, in the, after a revolution, um, Violence is a lot more random, well, for one thing, because people are, are trying to settle scores, and for another, you, you know, you have the fog of, of war. You don't know where uh, a new enemy might arise from, or, or where a new resistance may build, uh, where supply lines might break down and, and cause stress and tensions there, too. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's different, but in, in, in many ways, it, it is the same. Now, I suppose the ultimate answer, like, see... Because the hypocrisy comes in is like when Castro or China does those same actions, mm-hmm. they're committing human rights abuses. Right. Yeah. Um, now, of course, as they say, ANCOMs or as an ANCOM, you know, Popkin anarchists would say, of course, all of that is human rights abuse. We need mm-hmm. to not have a state that could do such things, not have this revolutionary violence, right. which is kind of where Popkin's going. That like just meet people's needs, and the people who meet the yeah. working class's needs will be the legitimate government because they're the ones feeding people as the ruling class doesn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the idea of embodying uh, the, the guards of the revolution into all of the people that are supposedly uh, best served by it, you know, all the people that are being put on equal footing, you know, providing for, focusing on providing for everyone's needs so, so that you do have a full belly in case some upstart comes and tries to retake power um so yeah i Mm -hmm. i i I like that concept a lot i i see it as uh potentially a a more stable and workable system than than trying to re-concentrate power into the hands of the of say the vanguard party uh, or what have you and just hope that they maintain the the course and and stay in the on the right side history and uh don't let the power go to their head so yeah very good and issuing pompous proclamations and decorating themselves lavishly with official gold lace and in talking about political liberty he dares to see from the first day of the revolution to the last in all provinces fighting for freedom that there is not a single man who locks bread not a single woman compelled to stand with the weirful crowd outside the big house door that a happily coarse loaf may be thrown to her in charity. Not a single child pining for want of food. It has always been the middle class idea to harangue about great principles, great lies rather. The idea of the people will be to provide bread for all. And while middle class citizens and workmen infested with middle class ideas admire their own rhetoric in the talking shops, and practical people are engaged in endless discussions on forms of government. We, the utopian dreamers, we shall have to consider the question of daily bread. We have the temerity to declare that all have a right to bread, that there is bread enough for all, and that with the watchword of bread for all, the revolution will triumph. Part two. Oh, I'm gonna pause it right there before we go to part two. Uh, before we continue on with uh, what was just said there, we got some questions coming in from the chat. Uh, oh, great. Perennial Green asks, why is affordable housing not incentivized more? Uh, I would say that... Incentivized by who? Well, yeah. I, Market I, or the state? Yeah, I, either one. It's, it's just uh, it always seen as an afterthought, something that 
has to be done. Yeah. Um, and oh, I, I can give it. I can give sure. it a sort of answer. Uh, most local governments are funded by property taxes. Right. Property taxes, you get more when the property is worth more. That means luxury or uh, expensive housing um, earns more property tax. Brings in more property taxes for the municipality. So a thus a local government will incentivize expensive housing, and then use nonprofits and other such policies or deal making to throw some crumbs in the form of a for some affordable housing, affordable housing. Uh, either in uh, usually in the form which is of course a failed policy where okay we're going to build the expensive housing but we'll mandate that 10 percent of it be quote unquote affordable meaning mm-hmm. slightly below market rate yeah uh, which means that maybe because it's usually tied to median income but if Mm -hmm. you know median income is 40 grand and what about all the people make 20 grand Mm -hmm. so then you have to say well it needs to be tied to half of median income you know that someone making half of mean income can afford this yeah um but again 20 percent of that is not you know you're only attracting you're only building housing to attract new people to live in the city um Mm -hmm. from the suburbs or what have you not housing for the people who already live in the city who are you know the leftover uh poor mm-hmm. people of color etc yeah for sure and it's kind of interesting that that housing is or affordable housing is always framed as something that needs to be built as though we don't already have i think the latest number was something like 50 houses for every homeless person in america right now uh that's not to say yeah. that a government could just buy up any random uh, vacant house, but there's probably a lot out there on the market that... Well, there's a few mechanisms to... happening, like in my neck of the woods. So mm-hmm. first we have a county land bank, which is pseudo-public, because uh, it's like a private institution being a bank, um, separate from the county government. Mm-hmm. Um, and they basically get any anyone who is late on their taxes, you know, and can't pay... Uh, to, either they have back taxes that they can't pay. You know, the... Um, it gets impound the property gets impounded and then it goes to the land bank. Right. They used to just do auctions, yeah. uh, where that's the person with the fattest pockets right. then gets to pick up all these uh, dilapidated properties or whatever. Sometimes they're not dilapidated at all. Sometimes they're perfectly good. Um, uh, what was the other thing that came to mind? I also want to m- mention that like the antidote is to change out of property taxes, maybe switch to land taxes, which is the George's sure. principle. Sure. Or just have no taxes on land, just tax uh, wealth. Um, right. Most people's wealth is tied into property. Um, and that's where we get into more municipalist and thus also ANCOM ideas sure. of breaking monopolies of land ownership and whatever. And, and that's, we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a later chapter. Mm-hmm. And, and for those not familiar, um, oh, what was that? oh, just had a thought and I lost it. Um, Is there another question? Yeah, there's some more questions. Well, let's move on to some more questions then. Uh, so September 918 asks, how do you think it's, or, or hi, do you think it's interesting that the book is called The Conquest of Bread, that YouTube is, or the, I'm assuming you mean the left side of YouTube is called BreadTube, uh, the most famous aspect of the Soviet Union we know is the bread lines. Um, and uh, as I understand it, BreadTube was kind of dubbed as such. And for those that don't know, that's the people that are leftists on YouTube and, and are, you know, content creators. Um, I believe it actually is named after this particular book, The Conquest of Bread. And yeah. uh, I think the reason that bread keeps coming up so much and then, you know, we talk about bread lines and stuff like that is because in Europe for time immemorial, uh, wheat has been basically the staple crop, the, 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 the thing that people depend on most to survive day to day. So it's just used as a metaphor uh for for all food production yes right. yeah it, it, it's supportable you know the, the the advantages of bread is that you know you bake it it lasts a while mm-hmm. you can eat it as you go yeah. um yeah. now on, on on bread lines let me defend them because the point of the bread line is that everyone's entitled to it you just have to be in a line i guess but yeah. um yeah. if yeah if it's organized a different way like by lot like the way we're doing vaccines let's say you don't need, really need to wait in line, but the point is everyone's entitled to the bread and everyone gets it. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't think there's um, anything wrong with 
giving people and better, the things they need to better, survive. Better, better to have a bread line where everyone gets bread than having a supermarket where half of the people get bread yeah. and the other half don't or a portion do not. Yeah, and, and likewise, people always rag on, you know, the, the brutality of Soviet and, and uh, communist bloc architecture. A again, the, the rebuttal is the same. Better to have ugly housing for the homeless than no housing for the homeless or the people in, in, in shortage of. of well, when it comes to contemporary people. capitalist architecture, That's capitalist group. I was about to, uh, I was about to get it's both. It's both expensive and ugly. Yeah, yeah. Just it's somehow you you see the same uh, structure copied over and over and over again, and yet every house costs way, way many times more than the the materials and the labor and everything that goes into making it. I can rant a while about this, but there was a um, <laughs> public meeting of sort where a boomer referred to while looking at the boards of, of certain proposed projects like this new architecture it looks like communist block stuff <laughs> and then like well but capitalists are building it sir it's, 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 it's not it's not soviet realism it's right. capitalist realism right right all right so uh september 918 has got a, a number of questions here so the next one is or the, I guess this is more of a statement. Also, the problem of false equivalizing foreign policy action with revolutions is that revolutions are generally bloody and lack justice. That's true. There's a lot that happens that is not great in any revolution uh, when it's a, a violent one. Uh, and often includes terrorism, acts on civilians, and murder of civilians if they belong to the wrong group of people. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm not That's sure. most war. I should mention, well, that is most war. So, yes, war is bad, and as peacemakers, we don't want that. So, yeah. I think what the, the allure of anarchist strategy is that it doesn't usually entail calling for, at the very least, a civil war. But if you get strong enough, there will be some kind of confrontation where the government will want to take that hard-won anarchist autonomy away, mm -hmm. and you need, you need to defend it. Now, defending is a lot easier than attacking, but that's kind of what the bind that um, Catalonia was in, you know, it could fight yes. defensively for only so long, right. and it's lost. It lost. Even with a million and a half Union members, they still lost the Civil yeah. War. Uh, a lot of reasons for that, of course. Not yes. saying it's because of the anarchist strategy, but the point yeah. was it was used, and it was still unsuccessful completely. Now, some revolutions, like Cuba's, were not very bloody, but uh, Castro and his guerrillas still did sort of terror attacks, but they were mostly just against Batista's military, the Cuban military. And, yeah, it's a mixed bag, but everyone was so sick of Batista that they didn't actually have to kill a lot of people to uh, march into the capital because it was, it was truly po it was a bit popular when it comes to... But then once he started doing actual left-wing stuff, that's when things got hairy. Because people just expected some bourgeois government to get installed. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, did you know the first thing Castro did that got uh, the U.S. to start wanting to kill him was rent control? <laughs> rent control. That was, that yes, was that over was, the line. That was the first policy that was over the line. Yeah, okay. rent control in, in Havana. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have some more comments here. I, I don't know if I can be able to get to all of them. I, I appreciate you very much for, for all your comments. Uh, September, I assume that's how you're pronouncing it, September 918. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to them all here because we, we're only six minutes in. Are there any other, any other people? Uh, it seems that uh, we have, uh, Perno Green has said she was talking about the state, uh, referring to why does the state not incentivize housing. Uh, my quick answer to that would be that uh, people that are poor uh, especially those that are housing insecure tend not to vote, so they have less to answer to when it comes to election time. Um, it's not a matter of votes, though. It's really about money. It's that they're, that not paying, they're, they're politically they're not weak, funding. however way you slice it's, it. It's quite, it's quite simply. Money is power. Right. The poor are not funding the government, so why should the government care the, about them as a constituency? The only power that the poor have is their ability to, as many any other left winger would say, is to uh, withhold their labor, their ability to be the working class. Thus, the strike is the main tool of 
getting any policy concession. They have to you have to go on the attack. Anyone with money, anyone who's a quote unquote taxpayer, can simply show up to a meeting, complain, and usually get some kind of response. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sums it up quite nicely. So yeah, um, again, September 19, 918. I, I appreciate this. Uh, not don't really have a lot of time to debate things. It seems like you got some problems with uh, the things that we're saying, and I do appreciate your you adding your voice to it and your experience. So, um, but I think we're gonna have to move along for now because we, we have a lot of a lot of ground to cover. This is a, a almost fifty minute chapter, and we're only six minutes in. I, I doubt we're gonna get to it all tonight, even, but we're gonna. Try and plot ahead as far as we can get to. So I appreciate that. Keep your keep your comments coming. And let's keep going. That we are utopians is well known. So utopian are we that we go the length of believing that the revolution can and ought to assure shelter, food, and clothes to all. An idea extremely displeasing to middle class citizens, whatever their party color, for they are quite alive to the fact that it is not easy to keep the upper hand of a people whose hunger is satisfied. All the same, we maintain our contention bread must be found for the people of the revolution, and the question of bread must take precedence of all other questions. If it is settled in the interests of the people, the revolution will be on the right road, for in solving the question of bread, we must accept the principles of equality, which will force itself upon us to the exclusion of every other solution. It is certain that the coming revolution, like in that respect to the revolution of 1848, will burst upon us in the middle of a great industrial crisis. Things have been seething for half a century now, and can only go from bad to worse. Everything tends that way. New nations entering the lists of international trade and fighting for possession of the world's markets, wars, taxes ever increasing, national debts, the insecurity of the morrow, and huge colonial undertakings in every corner of the globe. There are a million of unemployed workers in Europe at this moment. It will still be worse when a revolution has burst upon us and spread like fire, laid to the train of gunpowder. The number of outer works will be doubled as soon as barricades are erected in Europe and the United States. What is to be done to provide these multitudes with bread? We do not know whether the folk who call themselves practical people have ever asked themselves this question in all its nakedness, but we do know that they wish to maintain the wage system, and we must therefore expect to have national workshops and public works vaunted as a means of giving food to the unemployed. Because national workshops were opened in 1789, and in 1793, because the same means were resorted to in 1848, because Napoleon III succeeded in contenting the Parisian proletariat for 18 years by giving them public works, which cost Paris today its debt of 80 million pounds, and its municipal tax of three or four pounds a head, because this excellent method of taming the beast was customary in Rome, and even in Egypt 4,000 years ago. And lastly, because despots, kings, and emperors have always employed the ruse of throwing a scrap of food to the people to gain time to snatch up the whip, it is natural that the practical men should extol this method of perpetuating the wage system. What need to rack our brains when we have the time-honored method of the pharaohs at our disposal? Cut. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to stop there. Mm-hmm. Why don't you go first? Uh, yeah, just uh, talking about just... You know, falling back on the, the old way of doing things, uh, using threats of basically starvation to try and motivate people to work when uh, I, that just doesn't fly. I, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Like I think you motivate people a lot better by empowering them rather than just threatening them. So uh, I think Kropotkin is alluding to the idea that this is one reason that uh, revolutions don't last um, and they end up falling back to uh, old habits is because people refuse to either either through lack of imagination or through uh, just doing what comes easy to them what they're used to they they, they fall into uh, it, it's just that that old phrase you know here's the new meet the new boss same as the old boss basically they end up becoming well yeah well the, the first half is about how you know the middle class kept the wage system and thus you had to you, you weren't abolishing work, right. you know. Yeah. You had to keep work going in order to, quote-unquote, feed people mm-hmm. um, instead of just doing so. Um, then the second half is then about, like, well, if you're going to, right, if you're going to maintain wages mm-hmm. and not change social relations, then you need public spending mm-hmm. for public works. 
So whenever there's the policy rollout of even the Green New Deal counts as this, the thing that we're kind of fighting for that would be a right. quote unquote revolution and of a democratic socialist type, um, that still just counts as public works so we can keep paying people so they don't starve rather than reorganizing the economy. Now, in the long term, it seems like we do this economic reorganization through small reforms like has happened in the last 200 years um, because you don't really change everything all at once. And if you do, um, then you are turning things on its head and there's a lot of upheaval and a lot of Mm, un, undisciplined violence and unintended consequences, which is you know how things were done uh, in Mao's China. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, Kropotkin was uh, talking about this in some previous chapters. That there's basically no half measures when it comes to to an actual revolution. Something new. you can't just go halfway in, but you know yeah. keep a lot of the, the same systems, the old. Or otherwise, it just breaks down. You, you go back to to what you had before. And, but it, uh, it could just make you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. It could just it could just make you even more angry to know that like mm-hmm. bribing the working class off with public works right. is something that a ruling class doesn't even want to do or doesn't especially since the seventies didn't couldn't do anymore, mm-hmm. you know, or didn't feel like doing because it convinced itself. The Randians did a good job of convincing uh, the ruling class people that we should not be doing any public works, mm-hmm. everyone needs to fend for themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, hey, you have the means of production. Why should you have to share, share them in any way? Yes. And if if you have to share them, then you might as well destroy them so no one else can take them from you. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. That that I, I read Atlas Shrugged uh, last summer, and that was one thing that just kept bugging me about that book. Is like this is this is like your your perfect ordering of of your fantasy world. Why are you having your characters? destroy all these these means of production if you really believe that the workers are so incompetent that they couldn't do it themselves why not just let them fall on their ass like uh, no no <laughs> you couldn't because that would that would um you can't give them the chance to because um, that would that might prove that might prove them wrong right but they, like this is her fantasy world where there's like these great men of history that that you know deserve to be in their spot because they are all the the entire yeah. engine of of, well, of Grant innovation. is not known for actually being smart, <laughs> well, uh, and yet so many I mean, people she's known hold her as, up as as she's this. known as being yeah she's known as being a cult leader. Yeah. You know what's interesting? So, um, and I'm actually quoting like a video. I don't know who was doing it. it was a, either a YouTuber or a left tuber. Um, they were talking about Snyder the Snyder not if not the Snyder cut, but mm-hmm. just the Justice League uh, yeah. Snyder himself. Oh, okay. and how. Um, cause Snyder is a Randian, yes. a uh, little known fact, I guess. Yes. And I have to be reminded of it sometimes, but it makes sense when you actually look at his discography, yeah. um, that, and his main passion project that he wants to like get funded is, uh, a redu- redux of the Fountainhead, Oh. which as an architect, I absolutely love. Um, I think I read a, a, a few pages of it or something or you know maybe i just set it aside saying oh maybe you know this is important maybe i should read it and then i decided against it um when i got like a synopsis because uh just the short of it is this the rebuttal that never seems to happen to howard rourke the architect main character Uh is that no you aren't the only person responsible for a building there Uh are the workers who built Uh it there are the people who are going to use the building um the, like the, the thing that Howard Rourke or any Randian character is really fighting against mm-hmm. is the fact that they are in a society, you, there is interdependency. And that when you do something, anything, you actually are doing it for someone else. Right. There is no action you can ever take that is truly for, you. for yourself. Yeah. Because um, unless you are that type of new ager who only wants self-enlightenment, for the just to feel good, yeah, just and it's not, and it's not so you're a more compassionate person to others, though that's usually how uh-huh. they justify it. Uh-huh. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack. New wagers do the you know self centered things because they believe it makes them nicer to others, 
mm -hmm. uh, when really I mm -hmm. I would disagree with that. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's definitely it a actually lot of, makes them it makes them obnoxious. Yeah, in many ways. There's there's a lot of people, especially in like say the yoga community, who are just uh, chasing that next Instagram snapshot so they can uh, show how much more you know at one with themselves they are than than everyone else. Um, uh, so yeah. Not to say that there's there's anything wrong with with pursuing uh, self betterment in my opinion, but uh, if you're doing it just so you can uh, show how great you are and and how everyone ought to yeah. look up to you, then, there's gray, there's then, grays. Yeah, yeah. There's, then, then you've there's a lot of, there's a lot of things sold to self betterment when, mm -hmm. um, or it is self better betterment, but it isn't for making you better social actor. You know, so you can you're not a whole better. you're not a yeah. whole person unless you're acting socially. Yeah, yeah. That, and that's, that's what's usually way. that's what's usually missed by all of these new age or uh, hyper conservative uh, philosophies. For sure, for sure. All right. Well, uh, I'm just gonna, quite the tangent there. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. These are always very interesting. So uh, we'll just keep moving on along, though, so we can cover some more ground. Yet, yeah, should the revolution be so misguided as to start on this path, it would be lost. In 1848, when the national workshops were opened on February 27th, the unemployed at Paris numbered only 83. <laughs> a fortnight later, they had already increased to 49,000. They would soon have been 100,000, without counting those who crowded in from the provinces. Yet, at that time, trade and manufacturers in France only employed half as many hands as today. And we know that, in the time of revolution, exchange and industry suffer most from the general upheaval. To realize this, we have only to think for a moment of the number of workmen whose labor depends directly or indirectly upon export trade, or of the number of hands employed in producing luxuries whose consumers are the middle class minority. A revolution in Europe means the unavoidable stoppage of at least half the factories and workshops. It means millions of workers and their families thrown on the streets. And our practical men would seek to avert this truly terrible situation by means of national relief works. That is to say, by means of new industries created on the spot to give work to the unemployed. It is evident, as Proudhon has already pointed out, that the smallest attack upon property will bring in its train the complete disorganization of the system based on private enterprise and wage labor. Society itself will be forced to take production in hand in its entirety and to reorganize it to meet the needs of the whole people. But this cannot be accomplished in a day or a month. It must take a certain time thus to reorganize the system of production. And during this time, millions of men will be deprived of the means of subsistence. What then is to be done? There is only one really practical solution of the problem. Boldly to face the great tasks which awaits us, and instead of trying to patch up a situation which we ourselves have made untenable, to proceed to reorganize the production on a new basis. Thus, the really practical course of action in our view, would be that the people should take immediate possession of all the food of the insurgent districts, keeping strict account of it all, that none might be wasted, and that by the aid of these accumulated resources, everyone might be able to tide over the crisis. During that time, an agreement would have to be made with the factory workers, the necessary raw materials given them, and the means of subsistence assured to them while they work to supply the needs of the agriculture population. For we must not forget that while France weaves silks and satins to deck the wives of German financiers, the Empress of Russia, and the Queen of the Sandwich Islands, and while Paris fashions wonderful trinkets and playthings for rich folk all the world over, two-thirds of the French peasantry have not proper lands to give them light or the implements necessary for modern agriculture. Lastly, unproductive land, of which there is plenty, would have to be turned to the best advantage, poor soils enriched, and rich soils which yet, under the present system, do not yield a quarter, no, nor a tenth of what they might produce, submitted to intensive culture and tilled with as much care as a market garden or a flower pot. It is impossible to imagine any other practical solution of the problem, and whether we like it or not, sheer force of circumstances will bring it to pass. Okay. So, yeah, so again, the first part, kind of just articulating more about... Um, what to do post-revolution, just in, instead of focusing on anything else, focusing on uh, meeting the basic needs of everybody and turning all human effort towards that end. Um, I think there's some some interesting potential at the end there when he's talking about uh, uh, the, the 
marginal lands, the, the lands that can't be cultivated. There's been a lot of uh, research and, and, and development happening in the, the sphere of permaculture in uh, since the, the late 70s when Bill Mollison and David Holmgren created the, the theory that have, has shown that there's not really such thing as unarable land if you have the right techniques and choose the right uh, systems of, of plants and animals to uh, try and foster there. Well, oh, there's such innovations. Yeah, permaculture comes to mind. The other two things that come to mind when reading the, the last section was the, so the problem of like, say, when, when there's a strike today, a uh, factory, there's, there's a strike and there needs to be a strike fund that basically yes. pays any striking worker usually half wages yes. so that they can afford groceries and rent. Right. Uh, basic income, basically. Right. And But once the strike fund runs out, the strike is effectively over. Right. And if and if an employer or a big company knows how much the strike fund is and how long it could last, they attempt to outlast by hiring uh, scabs, scabs, but yeah. also hiring out local police mm. to enforce the property rights so that no effective picket can actually be made. You can't keep the scabs out. You can't actually stop production without maybe doing a sit-down strike, actually taking the building, which, of course, then is where you get into illegal activity. So doing it strike by strike, you know, is not the way, or at least it's not the way yet. Um, but it's interesting to note that um, we kind of need to practice this whole season, the means where it's even a crime property or use it uh, or squat in property that isn't effectively owned by anyone or it's owned by somebody that maybe the local city doesn't even know who owns it right. because there are vacant properties in my city where when asked like who owns this mm -hmm. and they don't they can't figure out who owns it or they can't or they try to look them up and they can't contact them mm -hmm. and then it becomes a question of well why don't you just re re reposition it so it can be sold to someone who will use the vacant property Mm -hmm. um, but then there'll be the lawyers will show up and say, oh, you can't do that. There's all these statutes. We got to do this right. Or, you know, we can't legally do that. We need to change the charter. We need to change state law, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just easier to cut through the Gordian knot and break some laws. Mm -hmm. But if yeah. you're going to break some yeah. laws, you might as well break all the laws. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, nothing is uh, what's what's the Assassin's Creed motto. Uh, nothing is true. Everything is permitted. <laughs> Um, and that's, see, that's, and that's, and that's like the, he keeps referring to practical men, I think referring to revolutionary people, but they, you know, they're ready to take over the state or the country, but they're practical in that, well, we don't want to change everything right away. We're just changing the government, mm -hmm. right? Which is what political revolution, a la Bernie Sanders, usually right. refers to. Mm -hmm. While the revolution of an anarchist is social and property-based in nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the other side of it is the more about the status quo than not our response to it, which is that when we have an economic crisis, recession or otherwise, it's basically that you have a ruling class or a middle who are, in fact, consuming everything. Mm -hmm. And if they lose some of their money or their ability to buy, then yeah, half the population loses its job, right. despite the fact that the amount of resources or production actually stays the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it becomes a matter of job distribution based on the demands of a ruling class, not the demand of the general needs of the economy, you know, because pretty much as, as far as subsidizing farms and food stamps go you know we have the government takes care of basic food um on both ends mm -hmm. so that you know seizing was seizing the means in our food supply look like mm -hmm. because a lot of our food supply is fossil fuel based that's true um and converting it all to stay a permaculture maybe so it will enrich the soil it will do all the things that it wants to do and even produce more food along the way especially if we are not growing the monocultures, 
which industrial farming does. Mm -hmm. But then you get in that, and that's an argument that you get into certain technocrats of like, well, the, the food production we have barely covers the world as it is. Um, it, or if we can't use fossil fuel, well, that, that's where you get into consular land of if you, if we lose the ability to use fossil fuels in our industrial food production, we need to switch to something else fast. Um, but this, yeah. and this is where we talk of going to vegan diets and, and just getting off of monocultures, yeah. particularly. Well, and this is where both uh, permaculture design as, as well as architectural design can really come into play when we're thinking about uh, living in a world where, where we're not as dependent on fossil fuels and, and that potentially shaky future. Um, things like passive solar, like just using uh, greenhouses more in, in colder climates to, to do year-round production, to things like uh, stacking functions with uh, things like aquaponic systems that more closely mimic uh, natural ecosystems and are able to generate food. Um, and at the same time, those, those sorts of, of potential tools uh, are really brought to a, a powerful place when you bring in ideas of mutual aid, as well as bu building dual power systems where you can actually, so, so like you were talking about the, you know, the strike fund only lasts as long as, as you have a fund for, and if they are able to outlast you, then the strike is effectively over. Well, if you have systems that are in place that are providing people these, these basic necessities so they can keep on fighting for what they need, um, you have a lot more power in the fight. It's not just based on a on a, a fund that can dry up. It's it's yeah yeah to take a legal path. It's like we need a cooperative economy mm -hmm. of co ops, yeah. food or otherwise, right. that Absolutely. would supply the strike. Right. Um. How long could it do that though? Um. As long as it's dependent on finance capital or whatever. That's true. That's true. Uh, or or the or, or the or the funding of uh, communities. Uh, with limited incomes themselves, you know, you kind of have to ask, like, what is a city's economic base? Mm -hmm. You know, and what it was, and and, and it kind of gets back to how all wealth flows from land and growing stuff on it. It's like you kind of have to start there, and any kind of collective or co-ops that do that first. Mm -hmm. You know, your community aggregated farm is is where it starts and then they could supply at least the food right but then you get into the rent so it's like all of the striking workers have to be in cooperative housing which can waive rent or, mm -hmm. or what have you right and then it kind of gets into you again no half measure you kind of like in order for workers to effectively strike you kind of need to seize a lot of other things yeah definitely yeah it takes a whole system to uh, to support do we have any new questions since we've reached uh, the end of part two? Uh, no new questions. We have a uh, bog fat dog saying that leftists are cringe. So that that jewel. You're you're, you're cringe, doggy discussion. dog. You're cringe. Uh, it's bog fat dog. What have you? Oh, what have you? Oh, dog fat dog. What have you done that's so cool? Yeah. Well, uh, he's he's written a message in someone's stream. Sorry, I'm, yeah, I shouldn't have seen him. It is is yeah. Uh, totally they, showed they up. They have. Uh, he's so message. cool. Um, yeah, Regular. leftists are cringe. Well, I best, I, I best just shut yeah. down the stream now and, and, you know, go follow John. I think, I, think the, I think homeless people are cringe. <laughs> oh. You know, them them being homeless and all that. That um, homeless is cringe. For I sure. think I think people starving is cringe. Yep. Uh, yep. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of cringy things out there. There's a lot of cringy things out there. A lot of things that make us uncomfortable. Uh, people. So 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 by saying we're cringe, it's like so we're making him uncomfortable. Well, why would that be, huh? Is he a property owner? Is he is he going to lose out if if we actually have a community based economy? Yeah, um, I I can't imagine anything that a leftist would propose that that anyone would really lose out on unless you have things that you shouldn't because you're taking from people just through virtue of owning. Um, so yeah, if you're not on that list, then I think you're probably better off with the things that we're talking about, but. You know, just a thought. All anyway, right, let's keep going. Anyway, yeah, let's keep going. Part three. The most prominent characteristic of capitalism is the wage system, which in brief amounts to this. A man or a group of men possessing the necessary capital starts some industrial enterprise 
He undertakes to supply the factory or workshops with raw material, to organize production, to pay the employees a fixed wage, and lastly, to pocket the surplus value or profits, under pretext of recouping himself for managing the concern, for running the risk it may involve, and for the fluctuations of price in the market value of the wares. To preserve the system, those who now monopolize capital would be ready to make certain concessions, to share, for example, a part of the profits with the workers, or rather, to establish a sliding scale which would oblige them to raise wages when prices were high. In brief, they would consent to certain sacrifices, on condition that they were still allowed to direct industry and to take its first fruits. Collectivism, as we know, does not abolish wages, though it introduces considerable modifications into the existing order of things. It only substitutes the state, that is to say, representative government, national or local, for the individual employer of labor. Under collectivism, it is the representatives of the nation or of the district and their deputies and officials who are to have the control of industry. It is they who reserve to themselves the right of employing the surplus of production in the interest of all. Moreover, collectivism draws a very subtle but very far-reaching distinction between the work of the laborer and of the man who has learned a craft. Unskilled labor, in the eyes of the collectivist, is simple labor, while the work of the craftsman, the mechanic, the engineer, the man of science, etc., is what Marx calls complex labor, and is entitled to a higher wage. The laborers and craftsmen, weavers, and men of science are all wage servants of the state, all officials, as we have said lately, to gild the pill. The coming revolution can render no greater service to humanity than to make the wage system, in all its forms, an impossibility, and to render communism, which is the negation of wage slavery, the only possible solution. For even admitting that the collectivist modification of the present system is possible, if introduced gradually during a period of prosperity and peace, though, for my part, I question its practicability even under such conditions, it would become impossible in a period of revolution when the need of feeding hungry millions springs up for the first call to arms. A political revolution can be accomplished without shaking the foundations of industry, but a revolution where the people lay hands upon property will inevitably paralyze exchange and production. Millions of public money would not suffice for wages to the millions of out of works. Cut. This point cannot be too... Go for it. So it's inevitably explaining how, like... Um working class or you know bottom up revolution or whatever it's a real disruption it's the really disruptive thing mm -hmm. um then there is the points of the observation that you know when incrementalists mm -hmm. take power they're they're not really shaking things up they don't really have the ability to right. like even if say um us commies get elected to local office there's really not a lot you can do because the social relations, the economic relations, they're still capitalist. You're still and a communist can do interesting things within a capitalist, you know, government um, and shake things up a little bit. Like uh, when socialists were elected to whole cities, they created city-owned enterprises mm -hmm. um, and, such, and such like that. But they couldn't, you can't reverse or, or, or re-engineer solve social problems you can only tinker at them uh yeah. or or paper over them yeah yeah that's, that's very true yeah there's there's only so far you can go we're still under capitalism and we're yeah. still going to operate by its rules until we kind of make that final push past that that left wall that's uh yeah so it's pointing result. out that you have you have a super disruption mm -hmm. and that means you need to deliver the goods mm -hmm. and if you're an incrementalist or or usually the the the, the, yeah, the response is we need to pick up what's available and what's available is the capitalist distribution or market distribution so you keep going using that you keep using wage labor um instead of instead of switching everything over you know even the soviet union collectivized a lot a lot of disruption some famines along the way just like capitalist uh, development yeah um still pay people in rubles um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
not just distributing things. I mean, in in the beginning of the revolution, they did have, you know, just shops where you go and you pick up your bread ration. But that was also a state of civil war. Um, Once all that's settled, people are paid in rubles to go to a store. And so there really isn't. That's the thing about the Soviet Union. There really weren't bread lines. There were supermarkets, and you went to the supermarket, and you used your ruble card, or the rubles you were paid, and because people were still paid in wages, mm-hmm. to pay basic rent, and buy basic food, and, and other goods. Um, yeah. Like in Yugoslavia, where all the industry was pretty much a work co-op, mm-hmm. um, I like this image where there was 30 different types of ch- types of chocolate. So there was certainly lots of diversity mm-hmm. just as there's three types of candy bars in our bodegas. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that brings up the, the difficulty in these revolutions uh, in that you're not operating in isolation. You're, you're still part of a global economy now more so even uh, a whole lot more so than, than in Kropotkin's time uh, you're going to have to, still trade for things on the world market and uh to do that you're gonna have to have something you can't you can't just uh it's, it's difficult to just completely throw away the system that, that you're using in terms of money oh unless you're north korea uh well okay that you could just go without electricity too and, and uh just completely they do, the well they do but you could say they only use it when they need it but, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so, Whatever, but the point is, yeah. they, they 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 at least have in spirit that they want to be self. They try to be self sufficient, and doesn't quite work that well. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. <clears throat> <Yeah. clears throat> or it has its drawbacks. It's yeah, serious. It definitely drawbacks. has some serious drawbacks. You know? And uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's keep moving along. Much insisted upon the reorganization of industry on a new basis, and we shall presently show how tremendous this problem is not be accomplished in a few days, nor, on the other hand, will the people submit to be half-starved for years in order to oblige theorists who uphold the wage system. To tide over the period of stress, they will demand what they have always demanded in such cases, communization of supplies, the giving of rations. It will be vain to preach patience. The people will be patient no longer, and if food is not put in common, they will plunder the bakeries. If the people are not strong enough to carry all before them, they will be shot down to give collectivism a fair field for experiment. To this end, order must be maintained at any price. Order, discipline, obedience. And as the capitalists will soon realize, that when the people are shot down by those who call themselves revolutionists, the revolution itself will become hateful in the eyes of the masses, and they will certainly lend their support to the champions of order, even though they are collectivists. In such a line of conduct, the capitalists will see a means of hereafter crushing the collectivists in their turn. If order is established in this fashion, the consequences are easy to foresee. Not content with shooting down the marauders, the faction of order will search out the ringleaders of the mob. They will set up again the law courts and reinstate the hangmen. The most ardent revolutionists will be sent to the scaffold. It will be 1793 over again. Do not let us forget how reaction triumphed in the last century. First, the Ebertis, the Batman, or Guillotine, those whom Mignier was the memory of the struggle fresh upon him, still called anarchists. The Dantonists soon followed them, and when the party of Robespierre had guillotined these revolutionaries, they in turn had to mount the scaffold, whereupon the people, sick of bloodshed, and seeing the revolution lost, threw up the sponge, and let the reactionaries do their worst. If order is restored, we say, the Social Democrats will hang the anarchists. The Fabien will hang the Social Democrats and will in their turn be hanged by the reactionaries and the revolution will come to an end. But everything confirms us in the belief that the energy of the people will carry them far enough and that when the revolution takes place, the idea of anarchist communism will have gained ground. It is not... Pause right there. What are, what are your thoughts on that passage? Um, kind of self-evident. I mean, it's kind of what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, in a few episodes of mine in the past year, I've discussed how, you know, we, we form this so-called united front to beat Trump with, uh, leftist liberals and everyone voting for Biden, anarcho-Bidenism. Uh, meanwhile, actual left organizing is left to languish or 
be done inside of a social democratic milieu, uh, you know, form where eventually it's just waiting to be co-opted by the Democrats because everyone is politically organizing or acting uh, to, to elect Democrats. Uh, and and the thing about um, United Fronts against fascism is they do beat fascists, but they also beat the left. Yeah. Um, because it basically allows liberals will then turn around and hang the leftists after the the fascists have been hanged you know the disruptors of of capitol hill get hanged and then so does every antifa uh like a like a colleague of mine who is going to go to jail for four years oh my. Uh, for, for stabbing a proud boy oh in self-defense in self-defense in self-defense, in self-defense too oh. yeah the proud boy was on and punching him in the head um but interestingly enough um you will remain anonymous, but uh, he is not going to jail for doing for the stabbing in self-defense, but because he had previous knife charges and here in New York, it was illegal to carry um, switchblade knives and whatever. So three strikes means he gets a felony charge. Wow. Wow. Yeah, there's the, the system protecting itself. Huh? Jesus. That... So, yeah, so having Biden in office doesn't help the left. I argued about this, mm-hmm. and, uh, and it really hurt. Um, it wasn't that for lack of trying on the Green Party's part or any other socialist. Right. And we tried to get it. We would be out there, and we'd be available. But it was a complete media blackout, not only from, no, forget the corporate media, but they, they actually covered Jill Stein enough, you know, to make fun of her and stuff. Right. But even, even the progressive media left-wing media mm-hmm. they would not talk to howie hawkins they would not promote us yeah. they would not talk about us it was disgusting yeah it was uh, disgusting and it kind of shows to me just how okay the so-called left mm-hmm. cares about building the left yeah because if they cared they wouldn't put everything about beating trump they would put yeah. some fucking energy into building up our fucking politics. And if you can't do that with actual sucking socialist candidate, then, you know, then you're not even, you're not serious. I don't consider them, you know, anyone doing that serious. And that was, and pretty much everyone on the left. So I'm sounding pretty purist right now, but it's frustrating as all get out. Oh, no, yeah. Um, because now that the Greens have been utterly destroyed as far as our vote totals and losing ballot access, now we are not viable even uh, to run for local office, you know, in New York and other states. We're not even viable for that. So now, yes, the only option is to be run as a DSA Democrat. Like, yeah, they get their way. They get their way because they chose that way. Um, by uh, Two DSA chapters endorsed Hawkins, but they were the exceptions. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other hand, I, I can understand the, just the absolute terror that people are feeling. Uh, with the potential of a Trump second term, my, myself included, really. Um, it seemed like it was going to be... Uh, ba- basically, we're at the precipice of uh, the uh, barbarism or socialism choice, not that any sort of socialism was actually on the, the table, but... Well, and the, then I think everyone chose barbarism, because uh, you're, <laughs> okay. you're too, as, as, as Shava would point out, there's the legal liberal barbarism, and then there's the right uh, barbarism. That's true. And, so my fears and the terror I feel is that everyone did not choose socialism. Yeah. Everyone did not. Um, yeah, it was, it was cut, cut off there. Yeah. Is a fear the fear the fear that there was very little import to building up a party of our own, or right. that everyone saying after Trump will build a new party, mm-hmm. and then you look at the the result, which is. Um, but it's like, no, it's too late. The time to do that was a two cycles or the last cycle. Oh, How about this cycle? You know, the time has passed to build up our own third party. We've been doing that, us Greens, and you have been ignoring us or giving us or making jokes out of us and joining the liberals and, and going, oh, yeah, yeah, that Jill Stein, how fuddy-duddy she is, mm-hmm. calling for forgiving student loan debt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, now a lot more mainstream. We're still, yeah, yeah, but anyway. Yeah, um, I know. I, 
I, I definitely feel for, for any third party organizer at this point. It, it's, I mean, because structurally, they are basically locked out of any sort of national election. Um, even even state and local too. Yeah, and that's what yeah. kind of gets. That's why that's where the anarchists make their case of like it's a complete waste of time to do any electoralism. Yeah, We're always that. Yeah. like it's not our game. We can't be game changers by participating. Right. Um, I kind of I disagree with that in some ways. I agree with them in other ways. Yeah, I can um, I can definitely see the the points of the those that advocate for harm reduction as the only yeah. legitimate use of of um, yeah. the ballot box. But, but until like, but until mutual aid networks and other anarchist mm-hmm. projects start actually organizing people to act politically, like in a city government yeah. fashion, I'm not like, I'm 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 fo- my arms are folded in skepticism. I feel that, yeah, yeah, uh, definitely so. Yeah, I think that's that's really the only hope at this point uh, to to have any sort of structural change yeah. where where the door could even be open to a third party. Where could, uh, yeah, because because Chad Chad like Chaz and other type yeah, of like yeah. autonomous those, those are interesting like, experiments, they, but uh, they, they can't even defend themselves, no, let alone yeah. any well, victories. I mean, yeah, they're, they're kind of out there on a raft on their own. You know, they, mm-hmm. they don't have. Okay, uh, all right. But no, no, that's, no. That's a no, I I really appreciate your, your insight on all of that very much. So, um, let's continue on a little more. Uh, how are you doing on time? Do you have any any sort of uh, I don't have any deadline. Yeah, we could go okay. another hour if you're okay. okay with that. Yeah, I don't think I, I... I usually try to keep it to around an hour and a half, and we're coming up on that in the next 10 minutes. I think... You, you could cut it in half. And yeah, that, that's kind of what I was I was thinking, if, if you'd be interested in coming back. Parts for, it's, it's, there's oh, uh, seven. Okay, so I think we're on part three or four at this point. I think we may have just started four, if I remember right. Um, the, yeah. Well, so, no, no, no. You stop. You stopped, uh, and we have a few more paragraphs. Before. A few more paragraphs before part four. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think probably tonight we'll just try to get it up uh, as close as we can to the halfway point. Yeah. And then, uh, if you'd be willing to to come, I'm back good for another week. Another week? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. I'm, I'm really enjoying this discussion so far. So I appreciate that quite a lot. All right, let's continue on. An artificial idea. The people themselves have breathed it in our ear, and the number of communists is ever increasing as the impossibility of any other solution becomes more and more evident. And if the impetus of the people is strong enough, affairs will take a very different turn. Instead of plundering the baker shops one day and starving the next, the people of the insurgent cities will take possession of the warehouses, the cattle markets, in fact, of all the provision stores, and of all the food to be had. The well-intentioned citizens, men and women both, will form themselves into bands of volunteers and address themselves to the task of making a rough general inventory of the contents of each shop and warehouse. In 24 hours, the revolted town or district will know what Paris has not found out yet, in spite of its statistical committees, and what it never did find out during the siege, the quantity of provisions it contains. In 48 hours, millions of copies will be printed up the tables, giving it sufficiently exact amounts of the available food, the places where it's stored, and the means of distribution. In every block of houses, in every street, in every town ward, bands of volunteers will have been organized. These commissariat volunteers will work in unison and keep in touch with each other. If only the Jacobin bayonets did not get in the way. If only the self-styled scientific theorists did not thrust themselves into darkened council. Or rather, let them expound their muddle-headed theories as much as they like, provided they have no authority, no power. And that admirable spirit of organization, inherent in the people, above all in every social grade of the French nation, but which they have so seldom been allowed to exercise, will initiate, even in so huge a city as Paris, and in the midst of a revolution, an immense scale of free workers, ready to furnish to each and all the necessary food. Give the people a free hand, and in ten days the food service will be conducted with admirable regularity. Only those who have never seen the people hard at work only those who have passed their lives buried among documents can doubt it. Speak of the organizing genius of the great misunderstood, the people, to those who have seen it in Paris in the days of the barricades, or in London during the great docker strike, when half a million starving folk had to be fed, and they will tell you how superior it is to the official inaptness of bubbledom. 
And even supposing we had to endure a certain amount of discomfort and confusion for a fortnight or a month, surely that would not matter very much. For the mass of people, it would still be an improvement on their former condition. And besides, in times of revolution, one can dine contently enough on a bit of bread and cheese while eagerly discussing events. In any case, a system which springs up spontaneously under stress of immediate need will be infinitely preferable to anything invented between four walls by high-bound theorists sitting on any number of committees. Part 4. Let's pause it right before Part 4. So, yeah. So those last few paragraphs were just kind of a bottom-up organization. Um, horizontalism is yes. better, more efficient than bureaucratic distribution. I agree. Uh, and it empowers you, people at the same time. It, it's not sit by and, and let the adults uh, make all the decisions for you. Thank you for all your service yeah. in our revolution, but just just sit, sit back. We'll, we'll take care. We'll take it from here. That sort of thing. It's it's thank you for your service in the revolution. Now we are going to empower each and every one of you to come to, to take on really the hard task of, of fulfilling the promises of the revolution. I um it's it's quite the opposite of like technocratic uh, thinking Absolutely. and why the kind of technocratic left or technocratic liberals like Elizabeth Warren and mm -hmm. a lot of other democratic or social democrats they still talk of plans and you know even the Green New Deal kind of is a sort of version of this though and the Green Party we kind of make it out like we're going to distribute money for projects it's up to localities forming their own like employment committees mm -hmm. to figure out what the projects will be you know usually today when development money or public works money is being distributed it's a committee of technocrats deciding oh where's the best place to spend this money for economic uh-oh uh-oh i believe i lost the call Uh-oh. Are you still there? Oh, I can't hear it all. I'm going to disconnect and try and reconnect here. Do I have you back? Are you there? Oh, I'm not hearing you at all. Oh, Did I lose you? Oh, yep. You're back. Okay. I can hear you now. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, well, they're usually like technocratic, you know, thinking of um, even when you have public uh, funding of public works and stuff like that, green uh, type of thinking. Um, it's, you know, it's a committee of capitalists deciding where money is spent right. in a town or city. Yeah. And then deciding where, uh, where the need lies rather than the people that actually are experiencing the need. Yeah. And, and so for as much as like, say, Buddha judge says things that numb tots like because uh, he says like oh well pedestrians matter you know yeah he's still a technocrat you know oh, it's yes. like the streets that are going to get fixed up are the ones in the richest part of town yeah so you can bike around if you're middle class mm -hmm. um, but the hood is going to remain un un unrenovated right yeah and then and kids will still get and skin kids will still get uh hit by cars yes. uh, it's it's fine they're just poor kids right and and, and the, the poor people will still be stuck with whatever mass transit system they have you know whatever slapped together kind of you know bare bone system that they're relying on at this point and yeah we'll, we'll think instead about uh commuter line which i got absolutely nothing against you know high speed rail cross country we are way behind the rest of the developed world in, in that regard but you know that's I, what's truly like surrealist about the the pmc is that to them neoliberals are not liars they do deliver the goods for them mm -hmm. you know when they when Buttigieg says oh trains and and bike lanes mm -hmm. they do get bike lanes yeah, yeah. they do get subsidies and they do get economic development that makes them richer or gives them opportunities you know because they had the pipeline they had mm -hmm. privileges and and so like they so they turn to their maybe they're in Facebook pages with other more working class or more radical uh, think people and there's just a complete disconnect between them because as far as they're concerned Buttigieg is is like a 
is not a liar about anything. Uh, and so is Biden. Biden doesn't lie. He's just, uh, he's, he's constrained by, you know, actually, no, 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 actually, I can go one further. That, you know, Biden is like, they will point out, they'll dig up the facts that show that they actually are fulfilling their promises. That, you know, the, the, the migration camps are being disbanded and that there are no more kids in cages. They either convince themselves of this or they pull out data or some kind of decree or result that shows that they are de delivering on their promises. Mm -hmm. But only so much that they're satisfied because um, their standards are, well, you can't do everything right. You know, there are constraints and money and blah, blah, blah. Um, but maybe there, you know, there's something to it there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But yep. Again, I, I wish they would uh, focus on more of a, a bottom-up solution when it comes to mass transit as well. Like you know, if you really want people to to have better employment prospects, they have to be able to get to work, and it's just not a reality for everyone to be able to to have a running car that that is in good working. Ah, but why is the work? Why is the work so dispersed? Why is it? Why is that's the work a, always two, a, three miles away? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's yeah. Yeah. Because that's where the, the, uh, green fields are where they can build for cheap stuff like that. So. It's good. It's, uh, it's wonderful. You know, the word green fields, oh, yeah, we, um, we there's something, there's something in good design that I believe in very strongly and something that we, no matter what should commit to, to know is that the place to develop or build is the place that actually is in the worst shape. Mm -hmm. And you can think about this when it comes to any kind of activism, start where things are the worst and improve there. And then you pick the next worst place, and then you improve there. Right. I yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, start where there's the greatest need, and the and the same is true of of uh, planning transit lines. Start where there already is demand. Um, we we have kind of a bad habit in the, the Twin Cities here of Minnesota, of like our first light rail line in something like a hundred years came in, and it was. Uh, largely through some of the least dense parts of Minneapolis. Um, but the, 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 their main goal was connecting up the downtown with the, the airport. Um, and their, their thought was to then induce development along the transit lines. It's like, well... Transit-oriented development. Yeah, yeah, transit-oriented development, but rather it should be transit servicing development because when we had our line between the downtowns, the, the, the green line, and it went through one of the, the most congested bus corridors that we had in the entire metro and, and uh, took over for it. it. It far exceeded all expectations of ridership and continues to this day, um, which just goes to show you that rather than trying to shape development around uh, transit, shape transit around development. And, and you know, it's just... All meet all. needs, you know. yeah, yeah. Meet needs, and that, and that should be the my yeah. local my local bus system here in Albany. Mm -hmm. uh, they did something that was both kind of there's pros and cons. So like they did retool the um, this was a big like overhaul a decade ago. They retooled all the routes to focus on the most used routes. You know, they they actually they surveyed like where do you go when you take the bus, mm -hmm. and so they mapped out all the nodes where people take the bus and then they redid the lines to meet the connections and from where people are you know people who answered yes i take the bus yeah you go here or yeah. i like to take the bus now what, what resulted though is they also cut a lot of routes and there are a lot, a lot of areas that are now not serviced by bus at all um but these are mostly suburban areas there's that we're probably oh no we've lost that audio again here, but it also means oh, that people yeah, can't it. take the bus but it also means people can't take the bus in the future if they even wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of eh, what's yeah. the where we go go from there. Another thing on mass transit is there's kind of a missing level on the neighborhood level mm -hmm. in the form of, and this is something I've only found or read about in an old like 
the Pattern Language book in, in 72. Oh, that's right. And, I have. I have not read it, but I, I do have it on my bookshelf. I always mean to dive into it. Oh, that. it's... It's 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 a it's a trip because there's yeah. two particular passages that I have not seen replicated or re-referenced again. Like you know, it hasn't been truly unique to that text. One mm. is it uh, proposes vans that circle around a neighborhood to bring people block to block to where the main bus stop is. That mm. way, the buses don't have to stop every block; they can all basically be express. Mm. And the van service all the areas between oh, the stops. And a, a van, which holds yeah. maybe six, is basically all you need. Yeah. And that also gets rid of the need for flex buses and or, yeah. Uber. You know, because wow. that's it basically fills in that that area. Um the other one that it mentions is I, I tried looking, but not very hard, and maybe I need access to scientific journal databases pirate or otherwise, is studies that uh, look at mental health in Scott and high rises. Mm -hmm. the, the writers of pattern language reference a study that showed that with the number of stories you live above like a fifth floor, right. the proportion of residents had more neuroses. Ah. Like living, living, the higher you live, the more insane you are. Yeah. I would like to see that either duplicated or to know if there's some kind of other study that's been done. And maybe there hasn't been, but there definitely needs to be another one. Yeah. Um, I actually to, have, to confirm this. Yeah. I have a relevant, relevant uh, anecdote about that. I, uh, I did a, an internship with a community gardening group, advocacy group, uh, when I was doing my undergraduate. And when talking with this community garden that served one of the uh, uh, housing projects in Minneapolis, um, she, she related to me that uh, the mental health of the residents there was very much tied to the seasons. And as soon as they saw that spring was coming, uh, their, their, their happiness level, their, their um, energy would, would spike because they knew that they were soon gonna have access to that community garden. They'd be able to go out and see all their friends again instead of being cooped up and isolated uh, throughout the winter time as, as they had been. So. Yeah, that would be a fantastic study. I, I, I wouldn't doubt that it's true, uh, for sure. And then there's the idea um, in urban planning that so pa so pattern language point, like puts in a rule that buildings shouldn't be above five stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that's, that's and this this uh, when I when I mentioned this in the nun talk group about the missing middle, I got a lot mm -hmm. of pissed off responses because yeah. I also pointed out that elevators are energy intensive and. We should True. think about a future where we are not dependent on them. True. Uh, that, you know, they, they should only be in buildings where people, the disabled or infirm, are going to be using it very a lot. A lot. Um, yeah. You know, only when necessary. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, we should be walking, walking using stairs. Absolutely. Um, or ramps, for that matter. I mean, no reason you, you can't, know. you know, if you're. You, you can have multi-level ramps. It's just a lot of uh, material. It's a lot of material, and it takes up a lot of space. Uh, I looked up the ADA yeah. requirements oh, for yeah. that, and it's something like well, yeah, it's like half well, an inch for every foot or something like that. Uh, well, for, um, the, the way I remember it is you need 12 feet of run for every foot of rise. Yeah, yeah. I think that's for, like, the, the bare minimum. But they were talking about if you if it exactly. wants to be a, a comfortable run, it's it's only something like half an inch per Per yeah, so to go up, like say the right. minimum of nine feet that a floor would be, right. you need you know, nine times twelve yeah. length, and that's and and if you and you want that four feet wide, that's a lot of space. Yep, yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, can, can no, this is not to be, this is not to say anything ableist. Um, no, for sure. But, yeah. Ramps, because it, it was inter It's an interesting, you know. Okay, let's. No, no, enough tangents. Okay. So you want to you want to wrap up? Let's do number yeah. four, and then we can stop. I, I I was just about to propose the, the same thing. We'll we'll get through section four here, and then we'll we'll call it night for tonight and kind of sum up a, a little bit, and then we will uh we'll wrap up for the night. So here we go. People of the great towns will be driven by force of circumstances to take possession of all the provisions, beginning with the barest necessaries, and gradually extending communism to other things in order to satisfy the needs of all the citizens. The sooner it is done, the better. The sooner it is done, the less misery there will be, and the less strife. 
But upon what basis must society be organized in order that all may share and share alike? This is the question that meets us at the outset. We answer that there are no two ways of it. There is only one way in which communism can be established equitably, only one way which satisfies their instincts of justice and is at the same time practical, namely the system already adopted of the agrarian communes of Europe. Take, for example, a peasant commune, no matter where, even in France, where the Jacobins have done their best to destroy all communal usage. If the commune possesses woods and copses, then, so long as there is plenty of wood for all, everyone can take as much as he wants without other let or hindrance than the public opinion of his neighbors. As to the timber trees, which are always scarce, they have to be carefully apportioned. The same with the communal pasture land, and while there is enough and to spare, no limit is to put on what the cattle of each homestead may consume, nor to the number of beasts grazing upon the pastures. Grazing grounds are not divided, nor is the fodder doled out, unless there is scarcity. All the Swiss communes, and many of those in France and Germany too, wherever there is communal pasture land, practice this system. And in the countries of Eastern Europe, where there are great forests and no scarcity of land, we find the peasants felling the trees as they need them, and cultivating as much of the soil as they require, without any thought of limiting each man's share of timber or of land. But the timber will be divided, and the land parceled out, to each household according to its needs, as soon as either becomes scarce, as is already the case in Russia. In a word, the system is this, no stint or limit to what the community possesses in abundance, but equal sharing and dividing of those commodities which are scarce or apt to run short. Of the 350 millions who inhabit Europe, 200 millions still follow the system of natural communism. It is a fact worth remarking that the same system prevails in the great towns in the distribution of one commodity at least, which is found in abundance, the water is supplied to each house. As long as there is no fear of the supply running short, no water company thinks of checking the consumption of the water in each house. Take what you please. But during the great droughts, if there is any fear of supply failing, the water companies know that all they have to do is to make known the fact by means of a short advertisement in the papers and the citizens will reduce their consumption of water and not let it run to waste. But if the water were actually scarce, what would be done? Recourse would be had in a system of rations. Such a measure is so natural, so inherent in common sense, that Paris twice asked to be put on rations during the two sieges which it underwent in 1871. Is it necessary to go into deep? Go for it. So, I like how we, you know, mentioning water how water is actually distributed even in market economics mm -hmm. but of course this is why bottled water was invented um <laughs> yes. because water companies or most particularly because most water is municipal mm -hmm. um or yeah exactly because it's municipal exactly um that water had to be sold in a bottle and advertised as superior to what comes out of the tap mm -hmm. even though it's, it's worse uh, yeah um, oftentimes and this is if it, if there's one thing, I am not some uh, militant vegan, but if there's something I'm militant about, mm -hmm. it's bottled water. Yeah. Um, like, I, I have this habit. It's really emotional. When someone offers me bottled water, I get offended. Uh -huh. And I'm like, I brought my own. I'm not an idiot, you know. Uh, da how dare you offer me bottled water? Or, or rather, or um, it will be in a, a case where it will be inconvenient for me to fill, say, my bottle of water from a tap. Right. But I will proudly walk away like, no, I am going to fill it up with tap. Point me to where the nearest tap is. I just did this with my friend. And mm -hmm. he's like trying to dissuade me like, oh, no, it's upstairs and you have to walk a while. Mm -hmm. And it's like, just tell me where it is, God damn it. And I'm yeah. literally like, it's, I, I asked him like three times, like, can you tell me where the sink is? A good sink is because like there's a sink in the bathroom, but it's the type of sink where you know it just sprays like aerated water it's not good mm -hmm. um but then there's a kitchenette in a, you know an office and and i have to basically like damn it just tell me where it is i'm not drinking bottled water mm -hmm. um and i've and i've been this way since my teen years i guess where i kind of just i because because it's fucking plastic trash and it's just making more yeah. of it and oh. yeah uh, how why does anyone fucking put up with just like the it's not convenient 
No. You know, when taps are all around you. Right. Um, but I mean, I guess I guess the inconvenience is they're not all around you. You have to walk like down a hallway or something to a bathroom, or you have most. The, and it's almost you know by design. You have all these public bathrooms with faucets that don't put out actual tap water mm-hmm. or uh, filtered water of any kind. You know, they're not functional that way because you want people to be able to pull a faucet and just keep the faucet running. You know. Right. Um, they're in those like kinds where you have to push it down and it only puts uh, out a little bit of water at a time, a time or it's always more it's always lukewarm you know uh-huh. but anyway i put up a lot of bullshit in my quest to never ever buy ball water and there have been times where uh, i was put in that like monopoly situation where the only water available was water you have to buy right. in a bottle and i but it's no i will be thirsty the next hour i do not give That's a fuck I would not fucking feed this this particular machine. I know it's a very drop. It's literally dropping a bucket as far as affecting demand, whatever. But that's what I'll, that's the hill I die on. Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. Good on you for for fighting the good fight in that regard. Yeah, I I too. Um, I I do a delivery job. That's that's my main gig, and I always just bring my own stuff. Like you know, no matter if I stop at a gas station or whatever. Um, if I do end up having to buy a beverage, I always am, am looking for uh, canned at the very least. So I have a, a reasonable chance that it's going to be recycled if I actually put it in recycling. That, yeah, that the plastic trash that's generated yeah. from the bottle industry is just disgusting. And, and for what? For just a little bit of convenience? And not for just from the trash. I just feel like yeah. there are a lot. most of us are doubling the amount we spend on food because we're also buying drinks. Yep. Yeah, you know, if you cut like, if you could drink water. consumption out, like you're saving a shit ton of money. Yeah, absolutely. But I was I was raised in a way where like I wasn't given sugary drinks at every opportunity, mm-hmm. so I never developed a taste for it. So like water is enough all the time, and wine, but you know other alcohol, but it's seldom, you know. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think I'm just yeah. gonna. Oh, sorry, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, no, keep going. Okay, well, let's just keep going. We'll try and finish it out. Kills to prepare tables showing how the distribution of rations may work to prove that it is just and equitable, infinitely more just and equitable than an existing state of things. All these tables and details will not serve to convince those of the middle classes, nor, alas, those of the workers tainted with middle class prejudices who regard the people as a mob of savages ready to fall upon and devour each other. Directly, the government ceases to direct affairs. But those only who have never seen the people resolve and act on their own initiative could doubt for a moment that if the masses were masters of the situation, they would distribute rations to each and all in strictest accordance with justice and equity. If you were to give utterance in any gathering of people to the pity of the delicacies, game and such like, should be reserved for the fastidious palates of aristocratic idlers and black bread given to the sick in the hospitals, you would be hissed. But say at the same gathering, preach at the street corners and in the marketplaces, that the most tempting delicacies ought to be kept for the sick and the feeble, especially for the sick. Say that if there are only five brace of partridge in the entire city and only one case of sherry wine, they should go to the sick people and the convalescents. Say that after the sick come the children, pour them the milk of the cows and goats should be reserved if there is not enough for all. To the children and the aged, the last piece of meat, and to the strong man, dry bread, if the community be reduced to that extremity. Say, in a word, that if this or that article of consumption runs short and has to be doled out, to those who have the most need, most should be given. Say that, and see if you do not meet with universal agreement. The man who is full-fed does not understand this, but the people do understand and have always understood it. And even the child of luxury, if he is thrown on the street and comes into contact with the masses, even he will learn to understand. The theorists, for whom the soldier's uniform and the barrack mess table are civilization's last word, would like, no doubt, to start a regime of national kitchens and Spartan broth. They would point out the advantages thereby gained the economy in fuel and food, if such huge kitchens were established. 
where everyone could come for their rations of soup and bread and vegetables. We do not question these advantages. We are well aware that important economies have already been achieved in this direction, as, for instance, when the handmill or quern and the baker's oven attached to each house were abandoned. We can see perfectly well that it would be more economical to cook broth for a hundred families at once instead of lighting a hundred separate fires. We know, besides, that there are a thousand ways of doing up potatoes, but that cooked in one huge pot for a hundred families, they would be just as good. We know, in fact, that variety in cooking, being a matter of the seasoning introduced by each cook or housewife, the cooking together of a hundred weight of potatoes would not prevent each cook or housewife from dressing and serving them in any way she pleased. And we know that stock made from meat can be converted to a hundred different soups to suit a hundred different tastes. But though we are quite aware of these facts, we still maintain that no one has a right to force the housewife to take her potatoes from the communal kitchen ready cooked if she prefers to cook them herself in her own pot on her own fire. And, above all, we should wish that each one to be free to take his meals with his family or with his friends or even in a restaurant if so it seemed good to him. Naturally, large public kitchens will spring up to take the place of the restaurants where people are poisoned nowadays. Already the Parisian housewife gets a stock for her soup from the butcher and transforms it into whatever soup she likes. And the London housekeepers know that they can have a joint roasted or an apple or rhubarb tart baked at the baker's for a trifling sum, thus economizing time and fuel. And when the communal kitchen, the common bakehouse of the future, is established, and the people can get their food cooked without the risk of being cheated or poisoned, the custom will no doubt become general of going to the communal kitchen with the fundamental parts of the meal, leaving the last touches to be added as the individual taste shall suggest. But to make a hard and fast rule of this, go for it. You know what? You know. You know what this brings to mind. Yes. Um. So so he's discussing how like you know you do like the communal kitchens like in Mao's China mm-hmm. or uh, in the Soviet when the when the Soviet Union was first established. Um. I don't know if they actually did it like. Did fully like that, but I know I know in Mouse China there were communal kitchens where everyone had to throw out their own walks for the to create metal and stuff. Mm. And that way, uh, everyone is eating at a communal kitchen, mm. and so they didn't have that you know freedom to still cook on their own or or take things from the communal kitchen that's like maybe semi prepared and then take it home. And this brings to mind how most of us are actually cooking. Mm-hmm. Um, not only are most of us, or, or at least those that can afford it, eating out, or ordering food via Grubhub or other apps right. or whatever, right. like we're all ordering almost from, not a, it's not a communal kitchen, but it's a certainly commercial one, mm. in that the food from the commercial kitchen is already prepared and cooked to apparently people's taste because there's a wide diversity of places. I mean, right. these are all restaurants, sure, uh-huh. but and that's what he mentions, right? Restaurants right. make and do some of the labor because it's a division of labor. Mm-hmm. It's more efficient that way. Mm-hmm. And then people order what they want, or they go to the, to the supermarket where everything's half prepared, whether it's the pasta, the 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 stuff from the meat department, or or the um or the way that um, produce departments can can have you know certain vegetables already uh, shaved or. Uh, cut up into the linguine pasta, you know, the zucchini, mm-hmm. um, zucchini uh, strips and whatever. Like that stuff can already be done, you know, the, the mushrooms uh, washed and cut. Mm-hmm. Um, all that labor can be taken and then it's not for, you don't have to do it at home. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how like things have evolved in the past uh, century along with health codes, which I think he refers to the fact that didn't exist in his day right. when he was writing yeah, uh, that's that's a, a really compelling way to look at things with the idea of, of yeah, things like Grubhub and, and all these, these kitchens basically already performing the, the same sort of work that he's talking about. They're just uh, doing it under the, you know, the... the capitalist, capitalist market, capitalist so they're market, squeezed, right? they have to cut corners. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all noticing how as the uh, closing and the pandemic goes on, local restaurants or, or the the takeout is not only growing more expensive practically doubling in price mm-hmm. um but it's also now starting to slip in quality 
Mm-hmm. Like they just cannot maintain yeah. it. But yeah, and yeah, and you know, it, it brings up for me just the the idea of of participating in a system like this. It just it it seems so inviting to me. The idea that that people are going to all come together in, in communal kitchens and and cook with one another and, and at the same time socialize and and get together and share some of the most basic necessities of life that that have been so sacred to to people as long as there have been people the idea of the meal time um like wow what, what as a, long as we're, yeah yeah i was just saying wow what, what a what a what a really uh attractive uh way to live that that sounds like to me at least for some you know it's not to say that you have to do every single meal this way you know there's well I, in, in in the in the times i've lived uh not lived but stayed at a um, collective a housing collective or mm-hmm. co-op house mm-hmm. the dinners are always fantastic yeah and you know the people there take turns making it you know the, the more in the co-op or collective the um you know, the longer you don't have to do it every other day, but maybe even just once a week, um, where you're responsible for helping make dinner, mm-hmm. and it's always delicious. Yeah. And the and it's also kind of part of as long as people are working forty or thirty five hour weeks, mm-hmm. uh, cooking is a luxury that takes more time out of right. your already stretched day, and so many either are not learning to cook or aren't able. To learn how to cook uh, or just not doing it or they just can't because of the time constraints and they do know how to cook um mm-hmm. i have lots of free time because i work part-time at best mm-hmm. and so i always have lots of time to cook then um but i, I always wish that like a, i still supplement my diet by not cooking every day because cooking every day is and every meal is a chore mm-hmm. Um, something that a division of labor is, of course, necessary, which is interesting when it comes to the kind of the competent man is the, is like the Boy Scout that can do a little mm-hmm. of everything. Mm-hmm. But division of labor is kind of what makes civilization work. I mean, right. I mean it's, it's the one thing that makes civilization what it is. And But if you're an Anprem, it's kind of like we all have to grow our own food and know how to do everything. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's something to knowing how to do it, but not having to do it day or all the time. Yeah. Well, and then it doesn't take, uh, you know, you don't have to be the, the lead chef if it's like your turn in the rotation. You could be the, just the guy that chops the onions. You know, anyone can, uh, you know, make toss a salad or, or, or put together some, some vegetables in, in a stew or something like that. So there, there definitely can still be that division of labor while, while everyone is still taking their, their turn in it, you know, as, as best they can. But, but yeah, like... Um, just thinking about how much that that you know just a simple act like this would really invest the the power of the the revolution and and its safeguarding in the people uh, that that it's supposed to be serving the people that the revolution is supposed to be serving it just it just seems yeah I, I, it's hard to put words into it but it, it just uh, it makes a lot of sense to me and it, it just seems like it, in a very attractive way of living in general and and just building those community bonds together so. That's really cool. The other thing that you don't have to, you don't have to repeat yourself, but uh, the call uh, the signal dropped. Oh, so sorry. I didn't hear you. The last thirty seconds. But we have a uh, one more uh, paragraph left in this part. Okay. Yeah. Let's which, just finish uh, that to off. Summarize. And I also want to mention for those listening to this that there's a lot of affectations and um, there's a there's a, a literature word for it, but. Um, things like explanation, like, uh, explanation points and uh, scare quotes mm-hmm. that are not being uh, announced by the reader, mm-hmm. uh, which would kind of do some justice because sometimes his sentences sound like thrown on sentences or mm-hmm. um, not quite like they don't make sense because he's not, you know, putting emphasis on certain words that he should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I guess that is something that you, you kind of rolling the dice when you have uh, a volunteer reader doing the audiobook version of it. Maybe somebody who's not even familiar with the material or any of the background of it at all. But yeah, so I mean, well, I, well, I think that audiobooks can be a really valuable resource. There, there is something to be said for, for actually seeing the printed word and, and how it is formed and, and uh, arranged with its neighbors. Yeah. So, but yeah. All right, let, let's finish up this, this last uh, paragraph here and then we'll kind of sum up some, mm-hmm. some thoughts for the the, this first half of the chapter. 
make a duty of taking home our food ready cooked. That would be as repugnant to our modern minds as the ideas of the covenant of the barrack. Morbid ideas born in brains warped by tyranny of superstition. Who will have the right to the food of the commune will assuredly be the first question which we shall have to ask ourselves. Every township will answer for itself, and we are convinced that the answers will all be dictated by the sentiment of justice. Until labor is reorganized, as long as the disturbed period lasts, and while it is impossible to distinguish between inveterate idlers and genuine workers thrown out of work, the available food ought to be shared by all without exception. Those who have been enemies to the new order will hasten of their own accord to rid the commune of their presence. But it seems to us that the masses of the people, which have always been magnanimous and have nothing of vindictiveness in their disposition, will be ready to share their bread with all who remain with them, conquered and conquerors alike. It will be no loss to the revolution to be inspired by such an idea, and, when the work is set a-going again, the antagonists of yesterday will stand side by side in the same workshops. A society where work is free will have nothing to fear from idlers. But provisions will run short in a month, our critics at once exclaim. So much the better, say we. It will prove that for the first time on record, the people have had enough to eat. As to the question of obtaining fresh supplies, we shall discuss the means in our next chapter. The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Read by Lindsay Thorson all right, so that wraps up the kind of the first half of this chapter here. Um, so another thing that, that I hadn't mentioned yet that, that kind of that last section of especially had brought up for me was the idea of uh, um, both uh, the way that we behave in disaster, in, in a disaster relief, uh, uh, as well as the, the concept of triage when he was talking about who should be uh, focused on first mm -hmm. to get the food. You know, we already know how to live this way. We, we know what happens when all of a sudden there's a, a, uh, a shortage of one thing or another. Um, we can very easily, you know, discern who is most in need. And, you know, there's no thought of, well, are, are you really that valuable of a person? You know, uh, do you really deserve to have the biggest portion? I mean, you, you can't even do this or that or the other thing. No, it's, it's, it's without a thought. The people that are, are most in need are the ones that get served first. And, and why should it be any different when we are apportioning the, the wealth of resources that our society is capable of producing? So I just, I just, no, this is, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. That, that was, that was basically the thought. Yep. Yeah. So this is assuming though, all of this, cause he, like he starts this part with mm -hmm. the, the, the start of it is, Okay, people are rebelling, and they have seized, if not the means of production, but they've seized the, the the uh, the production, the the, the right. produce, mm -hmm. and that the capitalist markets have been disrupted to the point of being uh, not a factor anymore. Right, and that's, that's the right. thing. Like so, the the disaster, the triage, the compassion, and the justice mentality. And lack of abuse by individual, uh, you know, bad faith actors and those that seek to sabotage as this communal kitchen. Um, they like what benefit? They, they only have this individualistic benefit, assuming that the revolution will fail or that there will be a reaction and the markets mm -hmm. or the ability to benefit from sabotaging this mm -hmm. uh, are there. You know, there kind of has to be a, a loss of hope that things are going to be doggy dog again. Right. Um, and that requires a basis of some kind of trust that this is going to work, it's working, and it's here to stay. Um, and that's kind of where, like with the Soviet, the, the Russian Civil War, you know, there just had to be a moment that after years of fighting and war crimes of all types and everyone being sick of it all. Mm -hmm. that the, the the Soviets are here to stay, right. you know, and um, and the socialists are in Moscow and they're going to stay there. Mm -hmm. um, and the whites aren't going to get rid of them mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's where maybe you have more peasants or whatever. I mean, I mean, what, I'm not going to get into that kind of fighting of like kulaks or right. small landowners who, you know, 
they still saw their opening to, you know, exert their political pressure or whatever. But that was only a decade in, you know, two decades in, then it's like, okay, this is the new status quo. You know, a generation has to pass. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of like the first generation, the first 15, 20 years is like the most essential. This is the one that's going to be chaotic and it's going to have disasters and, and, you know, whatever. But uh, in a capitalist system, we also have a disaster every 15 years. It just hits the the bottom half instead of the right. top half. Yeah, I mean the top half usually comes out much better because they're able to. You could say the suffering. The you could say in a, in a socialist revolution, the the suffering is distributed for the <laughs> for for a crisis. Yes, you could say that. Uh, <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Ah. Wow. So. Okay. Well, um, if anyone has any questions, now is the time to ask them. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm otherwise, still game for uh, for some chit chat. Sure, yeah. Otherwise, I think we'll uh, move into, uh, I guess, the end credits, so to speak. We'll, we'll uh, move into that. So I'll give the chat just a moment to, to catch up because I know it often lags behind uh, with the live feed. Uh, so, overall, are you enjoying this chapter so far? Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts, Dan, about the, the chapter? From from any angle, well, so stylistically, I, uh, I, the you know, what, whatever, what, however you take that. When you when you're reading old theory, and this is a complaint that's pretty valid about like, oh, why should I read old theory from mm-hmm. white men all, all long dead? Well, that's like kind of asking. I'll have to call him back. Um, why read any of the classics? Why read any any right. literature from? someone who's not alive anymore or whatever um fine then read the theorists of today yeah. um now i was i enjoy reading consequence uh, conquest of bread um it was a while ago maybe a decade maybe longer mm. um but i kind of half skimmed it as well i don't remember everything of course about it mostly you forget the things that are referring to French Revolution details right. and whatever. And you remember where he talks about, um, you know, the things that are familiar. Communal kitchens, doing food, not bombs, right. is like doing communal kitchen or distributing food that is available, that you didn't have to steal, uh, but seize nonetheless out right. of from, from the capitalist market and basically use it in a way the capitalist markets refuse to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, okay, yeah. I need to call back my friend. Okay. So, um, we'll be good. So, I just want to leave uh, by mentioning my show. Sure, it's I'll... the Three Laps. It is a podcast found. Uh, maybe links can be the, distributed, yeah. but I otherwise, can... I have a Twitch channel as well. It also just goes by the three left show. I do not um, stream very often, um, but I think I may be doing that more this month because I'm not going to be doing the show in the radio station for uh, project related reasons. Um, otherwise, there are 110 episodes now. Uh, so there's a full archive at three lefts.news. Yep, I just brought that up on screen for everybody. So yeah, just go to three lefts.news. Uh, I really enjoy your podcast whenever I, I tune into it. I always learn a whole lot, and it gives me a lot to, to come away with and think of. So can't recommend you guys a show enough. It's 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 really one of the best ones out there, and I'm not just saying that. So Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah definitely appreciate that. Um, well, thank you very much for your time tonight. You've been very generous with your time, uh, Dan. I really do appreciate it, especially considering how – Harley things went last week with the technical difficulties of the internet and whatnot. So I really appreciate you sticking with, and uh, I look forward to our conversation continuing on for part two of chapter five of the Compost of Bread. Uh, shall we say next Saturday? Is that is that going to be a time that works for you again? Sure, sure it'll work, yeah. All right, so next Saturday, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, um, go and check out the, the Three Left Show. Get caught up on that. Uh, what 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 is your latest topic on the show, if you don't mind, just briefly? It was 
co-ops. Co-ops. I call it. I called it the co-op question, and and it gives, and I can give a good like teaser as to how my format works. Yeah, so please. I collect articles or blog posts or what have you that have to do with a certain topic, whether it be the strategy of co-ops or type of news like eco eco news, you know, which is way more rapid fire. Uh, but sometimes I focus on maybe debunking, greenwashing, capitalist greenwashing, or kind of talking of permaculture and how to keep it decommodified, you know, not just make permaculture practice just another profession that you yeah. consult and get paid for, yeah. um, which is how architecture kind of got pulled away yeah. from any radical roots that it had. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, architects were usually socialists somehow um and then <laughs> and that's why I, when i saw this like local compass of different architectural styles i yeah. thought half of it was wrong because like look i mean after 1950 all architecture became capitalist in reaction yeah. um that if it wasn't soviet you know constructivism i guess but uh -huh. well very good or well, brutal you know yeah all right well, that sounds quite fascinating so go check out the three left show uh, it's available wherever you find your, your podcast, whatever app you use. And uh, just want to thank you once again, Dan, and I will see you next week. Thanks so much. Yep. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, thank you all for sticking with me tonight. Um, we're going to continue on part two, just to reiterate, of, of this chapter, chapter five of the Conquest of Bread. Uh, if you'd like, if you're interested in this sort of thing, if you've been having a good time following along, uh, and you want to check out some more of my work and see some some of the back episodes, I'm on all the different platforms. I, I, I put my stuff up on YouTube uh, as well as a podcast on Anchor FM. And you can find all my links by going to linktree dot, uh, slash bread theory. Uh, and that is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash bread underscore theory uh, Dot com. And I'll bring that up for you in one second so you can take a look yourself. L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash bread underscore theory. And you can find the links to the Twitch, the YouTube, the podcast, the Facebook, the Twitter. Uh, just recently, I've, I've added a link to what I am reading right now. I have my profile up on Goodreads so you can keep track of the, the sort of books that uh, I'm into right now. I just finished myself uh, The Anatomy of Fascism, which was incredible, uh, an incredible book. It's a very nuanced take on, on what exactly has constituted fascism, and it's uh, a look at its unfolding throughout history. Um, so if you like the works of uh, the likes of Umberto Eco and his Ur fascism, then you'll, you'll very much like um, the anatomy of fascism, which goes into even more detail and is even more nuanced and useful take for anyone who considers themselves an anti-fascist. So I highly recommend that book too. Uh, and I think that's going to about do it for tonight. Uh, so again, we're going to get on uh, this kind of streaming schedule of doing it on Saturday nights as, as long as that's what works best for my guests. And I plan on having a series, uh, another series of guests on uh, in addition to Dan. Uh, so we'll just kind of see where that goes chapter by chapter. Hope I'm, I'm trying to line up a guest per chapter at this point because I have a lot of fun doing it. And I always learn a new perspective from whoever's on. And I, I find that very valuable. And I hope you do too. So, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you guys again. If you have any questions, you can head over to the YouTube version or the podcast version of this uh, um, particular stream and leave your questions there. I, I really do appreciate all the likes and follow follows and uh, comments. So, uh, yeah, just, uh, yeah, thank you guys. And until next time, like time, friends. <laughs>